Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me uh, on this uh, talk about viruses and autoimmunity. Um, got a little bit delayed. My computer was, uh, for some reason today, decided to back up, so I had to wait for it to work. Anyways, um, I want to share with you some really important concepts related to um, viruses with this uh, concern from people that have autoimmune disease and if they're at risk. And um, just some background, I don't have... Uh, I'm not a virologist. Uh, my background is a PhD in health science with concentrations in immunology and toxicology. And I'm a member of the American Association of Immunologists, which is a group where you have to have an immune related doctorate and publish papers to be accepted as a immunologist. So I have some background and understanding uh, of autoimmunity, especially with diet, nutrition, lifestyle strategies. And I want to share some of those with you. Um, and I also created a free program for everyone who follows my work uh, at uh, Dr. K News. It's an immune resilience program. It goes over a lot of the key concepts related to how to improve your immunity with just lifestyle. And it's not really a promotional thing to sell supplements or products. It's just there to teach you some really important concepts you should know about improving your immune resilience. But I'm going to go over some of those concepts with you as well. So you know, the first question that has come up with me in my private practice working with patients is, I have an autoimmune disease, uh, am I at risk for coronavirus? And uh, I, you know, we have to first state that we don't really don't know much about coronavirus and risk factors. Um, that will take some time, but we can just go over general concepts of viruses and immune status and autoimmunity to share with you. So the key thing to understand is that when you look at autoimmune diseases and people that are suffering from autoimmune disease, the, having the autoimmune disease itself doesn't necessarily mean that you'd be at increased risk. Uh, what really matters is your immune status. So if you've ever had any blood work done, you want to look at your total white blood cell count. And if your total white blood cell count is elevated or within normal reference range, then you're, you're, you don't have to technically immune compromise. Now, some people that have autoimmunity, what happens with them is that their white blood cell count gets depleted. Their white blood cells are low. Um, so you can have some people have autoimmune disease and the white blood cells are like 2.5. So that would definitely mean that you have some immune compromise and you'd be at risk for any type of infection, uh, not just coronavirus. So if you look at 100 different uh, white blood cell counts with 100 different patients suffering from various autoimmune diseases, you'll have a percentage of them that have low white blood cells. For some people, when they get an autoimmune disease, their immune system gets weakened by the autoimmune disease and their total white blood cell count goes down. And when their total white blood cell count goes down, then they could be at risk for an infection. However, if you have an autoimmune disease and your white blood cell count uh, on your, complete, on your um, blood test is within normal reference ranges, then you really technically wouldn't have any increased risk. There are also some patients that have autoimmune diseases and, you know, they come in with a medical history and say, you know, I haven't had a common cold or the flu in five to 10 years since I had my autoimmune disease. And they actually have this overactive immune response, which, which for some people can be protective. So I don't think um, things would be much different with the, the new uh, coronavirus uh, pathogen. It's, you know, it's another virus. And whether you have cells to fight it or not, will really be a key factor. So there's also been some reports by uh, many physicians that are working with coronavirus saying one of their predictive factors of where, if, how a patient will do if they are diagnosed with coronavirus is their white blood cell count. And if their white blood cell count drops, and especially if their lymphocytes drop, that they could be at increased risk for the complications or having more than, more than just the moderate symptoms of coronavirus. So keeping our white blood cells healthy is, seems to be one of the the key things that, that you really want to do. Now, uh, one of the key things, oh, hello everyone. Thank you for all your comments and joining. So one of the things that I want to talk to you guys about is um, some general things um, about uh, what you can do to really improve your immunity. Um, first of all, uh, in a, a, so for some of you guys that are joining us in Hashimoto's group, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be going over some of the same concepts um, as before. Um, but one of the most important things you can do from an autoimmune perspective is to really make sure you get sleep. And even just from an immune perspective. So if you're trying to figure out, well, how do I improve my white blood cell count? 
Um, how to improve my immune activity. Um, then there's, there's a few lifestyle things that are absolutely critical. And I would say that, that they're much, much more powerful than uh, taking any type of uh, nutritional supplement. So the first thing is sleep. Uh, the immune system needs to have adequate sleep in order to function properly. So you really want to look at how many hours of sleep you're getting and if you're really feeling rested in the morning and if you are violating your potential to have the best sleep possible. So, um, you know, the biggest thing would be to go to bed too late and then get up early for whatever the reason it may be. But if you really are trying to support your immune system, you really want to get and get adequate, adequate sleep. Um, I remember my practice over the years, um, over 20 years working with chronic uh, patients, one of the biggest indicators we would actually change uh, white blood cell counts or natural killer cell activity on blood testing and lymphocyte counts was whether they slept. <clears throat> I remember I had patients that were taking handfuls and handfuls and handfuls of supplements. I mean, so many, not the ones I prescribed, but they were just desperate and they wanted to improve their uh, hepatitis C or their Epstein Barr acute remission. Um, and they wanted to, they were just taking everything they ever read about, everything at the health food store. And it, and it really, for many of them, it not budge until they were able to sleep. So sleeping becomes really the key thing. And when I work with patients that have chronic viruses, and I work with patients that are, have immune compromise, the first thing we do before anything else is just sit down, have a discussion and go, let's talk about your sleep. How are you sleeping? Are you sleeping well? How many hours do you get? What kind of, uh, what's your lifestyle? And the biggest thing that I've seen in my clinical practice is uh, patients just staying up too late, like for no reason. Um, and one of the key things is like, do you really need to watch TV or be on a computer or late at night? Uh, maybe it's just good to, to wind down. So for some people, they have to have a routine where they just wind down and then try to go to bed as early as they can. For some people, they have to get up in the morning at a certain time. Um, but for other people, um, it's just the fact that they're not getting enough sleep and just things naturally wake up in the morning. The best indication that you are actually sleeping well enough for your immune system is that you wake up naturally on your own. That um, your body just says, hey, I'm no longer tired, and you get up and you feel, and you feel rested. So that would be absolutely the number one thing to think about if you're trying to support your immune system. And when you look at the um, research done on this mechanism, it's pretty profound. So just like we need sleep, our immune cells need sleep. So when you look at uh, the cells you need to fight a virus and to keep your immune system strong, these are called natural killer cells. And natural killer cells get primed with melatonin. And melatonin activates the production of T cells and natural killer cells so that they can have the, the best response possible. So even if you have lost sleep for one night, your immune system is now weaker the next day. So it's a very dynamic um, a stat, a state of uh, function. So you may have even experienced this. You may have like in the flu season walked around and you're fine and then all of a sudden you, you don't get sleep and all of a sudden you get sick right after that. So sleep is by far the most important thing. Now, let's talk about a couple things. Um, if you are, especially if your white blood cells are low, if you're not, if you're not getting proper sleep, you definitely want to um, uh, think about why you may not be sleeping well. So if it's not just that you're going to bed late, you may just be the fact that um, you're hypoglycemic or you may be waking up in the middle of the night. So that's actually, let me actually get into that. One of the main reasons why people don't fall asleep is that they wake up in the middle of the night and the most common cause of that is that they tend to be hypoglycemic. So a lot of people will wake up in the middle of the night so they have a hard time going back to bed. And if that's, that happens to you, the first thing to, to consider is, are you hypoglycemic throughout the day? Is your blood sugar levels dropping? Hypoglycemia being a low blood sugar state. So your biggest clue that you are is that when you eat, you actually feel energized. You actually feel like you can function better. That's a sign that your blood sugar levels are too low. And, you, and if you have that response, then that suggests that uh, you really need to eat more frequently throughout the day. So what you have to understand is that well, when you eat food throughout the day, that um, when you eat food throughout the day, the, the foods that you eat eventually, whether it's protein, fats, or carbs, become glucose. And that glucose is used by your body for energy, but that glucose is also stored in your body as glycogen. And then when you go to bed and you get into a fasting state, in order for you to support your brain all the way throughout your sleep, you have to break down this glycogen to glucose. 
But if you've been hypoglycemic and missed meals throughout the day and uh, you've had some issues with that, then, then what's going to happen to you is that you're going to have some problems with um, uh, having that proper glycogen output throughout the night. So what will happen is your body will resort to breaking down proteins and then your body, your adrenal glands will release epinephrine and norepinephrine to break down proteins and then that'll wake you up. So really make sure that you don't have low blood sugar levels throughout the day if you're not getting adequate sleep. And another major problem, especially with people that get older or with women that have had children, um, is they wake up because they have to urinate because their pelvic floor muscles are weak. So if you really have to frequently urinate, then you really want to make sure that uh, you do some pelvic floor exercises for about 10 days and see if that makes a difference for you. And you just do these every hourly. I'm sure you can YouTube lots of pelvic floor exercises. So that's really important. With a lot of my patients that have sleep difficulties, I also have them use white noise. White noise is um, just a reoccurring sound. There's white noise machines. The best way to explain white noise is just a, a fan, a constant fan noise. It's not uh, sound machines of a forest or a rainfall or, or things like that. It's a very uh, continuous mon monotone frequency of sound um, that really helps people sleep and get into deeper REM sleep. So really focus on your sleep. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I'm reading everyone's comments. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to also dive into questions. If you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them for you. Um, once again, if you're joining us, our team put together uh, an immune resilience program. It's free. If you just go to Dr. King News, you can download the program, and I go into all the stuff with diet and lifestyle that you can use to support your immune function. Um, and uh, it'd be great. It's an, our attempt to try to support people in a time period where people are scared and people don't know what to do. Um, now, one of the questions that comes up all the time also with, with my friends, my family, uh, colleagues, patients is what supplements do I take? What do I take to support my immune system? And the answer is, well, you know, we don't really know specifically for coronavirus what supplements would have the biggest impact. And then there are some concerns that some supplements can maybe make the condition worse, which is all theoretical and speculation. But let's go over some general concepts of supplements, whether it applies to coronavirus or not, we really just don't know. But let me just give you the information. So one of the, let's start with nutrients. So there's basically nutrients you can take and there's botanicals you can take. Um, and then there's flavonoids and antioxidants you, you can take. Um, and when you talk about nutrients, without question, um, Vitamin C has been shown time and time again to be very effective in improving what are called natural killer cell activity. So let me explain what this means. Uh, when you do immunology testing, you can do a few things in the lab. One of the things you can do is you can measure the different percentages of, of white blood cells. And white blood cells uh, have a total number, which you can see on your uh, CBCs if, uh, if you look at your blood test. But then white blood cells are further divided into lymphocytes and neutrophils and eosinophils and basophils. And there are different types of white blood cells. The most important white blood cells to fight an infection are a subgroup called lymphocytes. And lymphocytes are the main cells that are involved with uh, destroying um, uh, uh, infection. So your lymphocytes further break down to T cells, which kill pep, uh, viruses and natural killer cells, and then B cells which make antibodies. The unique feature of a virus is that a virus will come in and hide inside the cell. And once a virus gets into the cell, uh, the cell then has an uh, immune response called the development of uh, MCHC proteins, which then is an immune mechanism where um, there's messengers sent on top of the cell for your immune system to make antibodies, to tag it, and then for T cells to come in and destroy it. That's all happening with the, the lymphocytes. And when you look at vitamin C, vitamin C has been shown to really help this natural killer cell activity, but it doesn't necessarily raise your numbers. So when you look at um, one of the tests that are done with uh, lymphocytes, there's a, there's a test called the natural killer cell function test. And most of your conventional labs will have a test called natural killer cell function test. And what they do with this test is they take the patient's blood, just like as you would get from donating, uh, um, go in and get a blood draw. And once you get the blood test, they take the white blood cells, the natural, they isolate natural killer cells from it, they expose it to some type of antigen, usually it's something called pokeweed mitogen, and then they trigger it to see if there's an immune response against it. And they see how aggressively the natural killer cell can destroy that antigen, and they give a quantitative number for that. So that's called NK cell activity. 
So there's been some fantastic research that shows vitamin C really increases NK cell activity. Now that's just a general guideline um, for viruses, but you know, we don't, again, we don't know with coronavirus. So it's possible some of these things may aggravate it. Maybe some of the things can aggravate the irritation, but as a general concept, uh, vitamin C has pretty solid research. Vitamin A and vitamin D have pretty solid research. One of the key features um, about coronavirus also in general is that the, mech the pathophysiology, the mechanism of why it causes disruption is it's actually breaking down the lung epithelial system. So it's actually causing a leaky lung, just like people talk about leaky, leaky guts. So the virus comes in, destroys the vascular epithelial layer, and then that leads into a, a vulnerable state for developing pneumonia. And when you look at the lung barrier system, um, there's been some studies that really show uh, that having a high antioxidant status prevents breakdown of the lung barrier. So we know there's some patients that have different types of infections, and when they get the infections, um, some people have moderate symptoms, some people have severe. So there's a few reasons for that. One of them could be their antioxidant status in general, protecting their, their lung epithelium. They've certainly done animal studies where they infect the gut or put a pathogen in the lungs and see when the tissues break down, and there were some correlations between break. So normally you can really support your own glutathione status by eating foods very high in sulfur. So sulfur, you know, sulfur vegetables, um, like asparagus, garlic, onion, those things really help to produce your own glutathione levels. We don't know if glutathione supplementation or precursor supplements like N-acetylcysteine will be appropriate for things like coronavirus. It's just there's no one has done the research. Those things traditionally raise glutathione, but there's also some research in literature that shows that glutathione can aggravate upper respiratory conditions. So this is kind of the frustration we have for, for us that um, have experience in training in immunology and nutrition of kind of trying to pick it, put together the pieces. There's a part of it that uh, <clears throat> we just don't know. Now, when it comes to botanicals, um, and if you were to just to go and do a literature search on botanicals, the uh, strongest evidence for an upper respiratory uh, infection and protection for immunity is echinacea. And echinacea has several thousand studies in multiple clinical trials and what are called meta-analysis studies. Meta-analysis studies when they take a lot of clinical trials and they add up all the data to see that all these clinical trials come up with the conclusion. And the conclusion has been actually positive in these uh, echinacea meta-analysis studies that uh, there is some protective effects with with echinacea. Now, each virus could be unique, so it may not have the same benefit, for example, with coronavirus, but that's one key thing. If you do have autoimmune disease, you gotta be very, very careful with things like botanicals that stimulate the immune system, because it can also trigger your autoimmune response. So just be aware of that if you're, if you're looking at having, if you have an underlying autoimmune issue. Um, so <clears throat> that's one thing. And then when you look at general antioxidants, one of the key things to remember is that your ability to protect your <clears throat> lung epithelium, your ability to decrease your inflammatory response is how much your antioxidant status is. So superfoods like uh, acai and blueberry, raspberry, things that are really rich in flavonoids really have a big impact on supporting um, your antioxidant status. So those are key things. And then foods that are fried, fruits that are processed, like partially hydrogenated fats, really wipe out your antioxidant reserves because they're very inflammatory. So those are some things to, to really think about. I talk about that more in the immune resilience program, but that's the basic concept. <clears throat> now, let me, let me kind of get into some questions here. What is your favorite uh, immune supplement? I don't, my favorite immune supplement is sleep. <laughs> I'm just trying to, I'm <clears throat> just trying to sway away from the focus on supplements, but those are just some things to think about. Um, now, the safest stuff I think to take would be just A, C, and D. Uh, botanicals get a little bit more, more uh, aggressive. Okay. Now, please comment the use of herbal such as echinacea and your graphs, etc., with autoimmunity. So, this is what I was trying to mention a little bit earlier. With echinacea, one of the key things is that echinacea uh, is an immune enhancer. For some people have autoimmunity, when they take immune enhancers, it may, it may really flare them up. So that's one of the key things that's there. Okay. There are, thank you. Get some water. Okay. All right, let me go into some more questions here. Um, can, you, can you review about what you said about the connection between blood sugar dysregulation, protein breakdown, adrenaline, and epinephrine? Yeah, we're gonna save, we're gonna save this video. 
and you can play back. But basically the concept is if you're hypoglycemic throughout the night, if you're not getting enough blood sugar reserves throughout the day, then in the middle of the night, you don't have glycogen to so have this epinephrine release. Okay. Uh, what is the best kind of vitamin C to take? There's, there's some controversy about taking azorbate versus azorbic acid. As far as the literature goes in natural killer cells, uh, either one will have an effect. Okay. Now, um, let's talk about a few other things. Now, one of the other key things that really has a huge impact on immune function is your general opioid status throughout the day. So let me explain what I mean by that. So your body makes opioids throughout the day, uh, whether it's uh, a positive emotional response, whether it's a, a healthy relationship with family members, whether it's just a hug, um, whether it's watching a movie that makes you feel good. Um, opioids have a profound impact on our immune system. Exercise has a profound impact on our opioid system. So <clears throat> things like T regulatory cells and T cells, they all have receptor sites for opioids. So one of the things to, to really talk about is really this, this concept of, um, of how do you really improve your opioid content. Now, on the same time, if you really have a lots of fear and you have lots of anxiety that can really devastate your immune system. So I think one of the problems we're having right now is everyone is just so focused and so scared with coronavirus and the things that are happening. And all they do is watch the new, and they see the death rates go up and they see this, this virus spread and they just really get really scared and get really nervous. And they constantly watch that all day. That will have a negative impact on your immune system. You may want to do is you may want to watch some videos that really make you happy. Maybe you pull out your phone, for, find some, times with your family that were great, watch those videos, some recordings you had. Um, you may want to watch funny YouTube clips. You may want to watch the movies that you love, but keeping your immune system healthy really has a lot to do with your, your state of mind. There's an entire field of immunology called the psycho, psychoneuroimmunology, and it has its own journals, it has its own field of study, and there's no question that your thought process and your, your mood and your emotions have a significant impact on your, your immune status. And those things may not show up directly on a, a total white blood cell count, but they have a significant function in how your immune cells function when they, they do functional type testing. And it's also dynamic. It also changes from day to day. So you really want to, you know, think about if you're at home, cherish the time you have at home, uh, cherish the time you have with your family, watch the movies you used to love. Laughing is really critical. Um, those things really have a profound impact on, on your immune health and, and your immune system. So you really want to maybe put some extra effort into doing things that really impact your opioid response um, with which you're getting your, your, your body and brain exposed to. So think about that. The other key thing that you really want to uh, understand about opioid responses too is that opioids, again, impact your T cells, regulatory T cells, they improve your immune function, and you make your, your opioids yourself uh, physiologically, is that Exercise has a profound impact on various aspects of immune function. And I talk about this more in the immune resilience program. But one of the things that we know is that when you exercise um, and you get that exercise high, that exercise high is basically a release of opioids. And then those opioids have a profound impact on your overall immune function. And then also when you exercise, you produce some free radicals, but you have a huge surge of antioxidants afterwards that last many, many hours after your exercise. And then those antioxidants protect your tissues, like your lung epithelium and your gut barrier and the rest of your body from any kind of inflammatory reaction. So you, you really want to you know, think about that also as you're trying to improve your immune fitness. Um, and the key thing is you don't have to necessarily exercise for an hour or two hours to get this opioid effect. You just want to just feel a little bit better. I think for most people, if they even spend five or 10 minutes just getting the heart rate up, they would feel a lot better. Now, the other key thing about exercise in the immune system is that when you look at exercise in the immune system, um, you have some issues with, uh, you actually, when you contract your muscles, you're actually pumping out what are called lymphatic system. So when you look at uh, the immune system, your blood vessels and everything, your immune cells are just circulating around, but they have to communicate with each other. And they communicate with each other through your lymph nodes and through, through your blood. So if you take a look at, let's say, your shower, the water running through your shower, you can, you can equate that to blood flow and circulation, and then your drainage of water from your shower into your drains is your lymphatic system. And your immune system has to communicate with um, 
things throughout your body of any pathogens or any triggers there. And it can only do that if your circulation is, is, is functioning well and your lymphatics are working. So if, for example, your immune system found a pathogen like a virus and, and it started to react against it and engulf it, it sends messengers out to the rest of your immune system to know that there's a pathogen there. And then those messenger systems circulate in your blood. Uh, and then they also, um, these immune cells communicate with lymph nodes where there's stacks of immune cells ready to figure out what to do. They're all waiting there. So when you imp increase your heart rate and you get your muscles moving your lymphatics, because you, as you pump your muscles and, and move your muscles, that makes your lymphatics contract and move fluid around. Um, that really makes a huge impact on your immune function. So those are, those are key things to, to, to consider. Now, um, let me try to get to some of these, these questions here. Man, some of these questions are very sophisticated. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. They're, and they're also, it's also hard, difficult to give personal health advice on any questions because, you know, I don't know your history and what other factors are there. Okay. Now, let's see if I can answer some of these. Not clear how much vitamin C is effective is a question uh, by CB Sunshine. Thank you for asking that. I'm sorry if I'm missing some of your questions. Um, I, I'm trying to, there's so many coming in. Uh, well, with vitamin C, the key thing is, um, you know, you, at least a thousand milligrams would be the, the least amount. Um, some people really, what they do with vitamin C is they keep adding a thousand milligrams a day until they get to a watery bowel movement, which is usually around 5,000 milligrams and they back off. That's where they get their saturation of vitamin C. But again, once again, we don't really know what, um, what type of factors uh, can impact that. Now, there's been a lot of focus. Let me explain a lot of things too with nutrition and so forth. Like for example, you talk about phospholipase A2 and then look at the mechanism of a coronavirus and these people talking about certain stuff that you can't take because it aggravates it. That is complete speculation. This is the problem that we have with people, I don't know how to say it any other way, that really don't understand how the immune system works. The immune system is not about one enzyme or one pathway. The immune system is an integrated uh, symphony of movements that are all happening together. And um, the best analogy to that is you can't understand a football game if you just look at the quarterback. If you, all you did was study the quarterback, you wouldn't understand every, what's happening in the game. You have to look at all the players. So when you're looking at different types of immune responses, immune functions, you know what I'm seeing happen on the internet right now is someone will find some paper on vitamin A or or vitamin D and talk about how it can shut down one part of the immune response. And coronavirus has some association with that. And they go, oh my God, hands off. That's, that's, that's speculation. That's also a part of not really understanding how the immune system functions and works. Um, so that's, that's very frustrating. It's one of the things that we're seeing out there. So I would say when people comment like that, it really shows that they don't understand how immune system function work. It's never about one single pathway. It's really about an overall effect. And we really do not have uh, enough information to speculate whether supplement will be harmful or beneficial yet. So there is, there's a the point of this where you have to ask yourself, go, what do I think? What do I want to do for my immune systems for supplements versus not? The focus of my immune resilience program that I developed for people is actually to not talk about supplements at all. Just talk about things like sleep that we talked about, things like exercise we talked about, things about getting the opioid response. Those things are all are all critical for, for getting the, the best immune response. Okay. Um, uh, keeping your immune system healthy has to do with the state of mind. Yeah, exactly. That's it's a key thing. Now, um, let's talk about a few other things here. Maybe some questions. And then one of the questions that came up by Tim is, what about short-chain fatty acids and immunity? So in, in, in the gut, and the microbiome. So we know that the immune system has a direct impact from the gastrointestinal system. The gastrointestinal is a huge part of the immune system. So keeping your gut healthy is really critical. Um, you know, uh, short-chain fatty acids was a comment someone brought up. Short-chain fatty acids like butyrate can be, I think, helpful. The, there's no shines of, of anywhere in the literature where butyrate aggravates the immune response or a bile response. And, and, and uh, butyrate, you can be taken as a supplement, but you can actually increase your own, produce your own butyrate in the gut by taking high fiber type foods. So one of the other key things that really will impact your immune system 
hotspot diet. So let's focus on diet for a second. It's a basic hotspot diet. You want to make sure you're eating a high fiber diet to really impact your gut immune system and your overall immune health. So fiber, when you ingest fiber, uh, soluble and insoluble fiber, you get some production of what are called short chain fatty acids, butyrate, acetate, propanate. And these short chain fatty acids immediately turn on cells in the gut called T-reg cells. And these T-reg cells in the gut then send messenger proteins out to the rest of the immune system, especially if you're getting some physical activity and getting your heart rate up, even more efficient. Then these T-reg cells start modulating your immune system and they make your immune system very, very efficient to coordinate an immune response to either fight an infection or immune system, to keep your immune system healthy. So it's really important you eat a high fiber diet. High fiber diets really make a big impact on raising butyrate levels, short chain fatty acids in your system. And the other key thing that we've learned over the past few years is that diversity of the microbiome is critical for immune function. So you really want to eat a diverse list of vegetables. Um, and we talk about that in my immune tolerance program, but one of the things we teach people how to do is to, to take lots of different vegetables and fruits, uh, lots of different vegetables and fibers, and then blend them all up in a Vitamix. So they have 15, 20 different vegetables, take, and then blend it all up, and they take a couple of teaspoons of that a day. And when you have a diverse vegetable intake, that causes lots of diversity in your gut microbiome. And as your gut microbiome gets really diverse, that tends to have a profound impact on your immune system. So the bacteria in your gut are actually producing messenger proteins, um, things such as lipopolysaccharides. And these lipopolysaccharides then communicate with your immune cells throughout the rest of your body, throughout your lymphatic system, and then you get this coordinated message of what's happening. So when your gut gets lots of fiber, it gets short chain fatty acids, you have a diverse list of fibers, you have more bacterial species, the more healthy bacterial species you get, they produce what are called polysaccharides, they're immune modulators. Those immune modulators in your gut get taken up into your enteric lymphatic system, your gut lymphatic system, that gets into your thoracic duct and goes all throughout your body. And now the changes in your diet with uh, improving your microbiome diversity through a diverse list of vegetables has really impacted how efficient your immune system becomes. So uh, it's really important that you eat a diverse list of vegetables um, when you're trying to improve your immunity, however you can make that happen however you can do it. Uh, it's, it's key. Now, the worst thing people do uh, is they just eat the same thing every day. Now, we also know that diets that are really, really high in sugar shut down the immune system. And the studies on this are, are pretty scary. They're pretty, they're pretty uh, uh, drastic. So exposure to, let's say, a concentrated amount of sugar, like a glass of fruit juice, um, something very sweet. Sometimes they put uh, sweeteners in cough syrups. Uh, the, that, that concentrated amount of sugar has been shown to shut down natural killer cell activity for several hours. So, you know, the worst thing you could be doing is eating a fried food, pro-inflammatory diet, little vegetables, and lots of sugar. And some people are. Some people are really just depressed being at home, and they're kind of dealing with the depression with eating lots of uh, you know, bought food in boxes and bags and sugars, and maybe it's gluten-free, but it's still a lot of sugar and still has very little fiber in your diet. Those things still will impact your immune system. So that's one thing to, to be, be very conscious of. You definitely want to limit your concentrated sugar intake. Concentrated sugar means there's no fiber to counteract it. So, you know, fruit's okay because fruit, uh, most fruits, especially low glycemic fruits are okay, um, like an apple, because there's lots of fiber there. And that fiber prevents your glucose in the fruit to not be quickly taken up. Um, there's no spike. But when you just juice it and have just pure apple juice or something, then you get a huge concentration of sugar load into your system. And then that has uh, been found to have an immune suppressing effect actually. So uh, that's something to be very, very, very aware of. Okay. And, and one of the things that I'm really not a fan is of just people just eating, drinking fruit juice all day, thinking they're getting their vitamin C source that way, that's really a terrible idea. You really want to understand the sugar aspect of it has a, has a big impact on that as well, okay? All right, um, people keep asking the differences between TH1, TH2. It's a little more sophisticated for this talk. I really would like not to go into that. Um, we talked about it in the book, but uh, nice to see you on board, Amy. I'm sorry, I can't answer that, just uh, not, not where I want to focus this on. Okay, um, to the key thing that you really want to 
to understand about keeping your immune system healthy is that you really want to get into a pattern. So if you're really trying to keep your immune system healthy, um, you know, reducing your sugar intake, eating lots of plant fibers, diverse plant fibers, getting some physical activity in where you're not totally exhausted, but you get an exercise high and you feel like you can recover and do the same thing again the next day. Uh, those have a dramatic impact. Having healthy relationships, discussions, those things all seem to, to, to have a, a pretty profound response. Um, so like David put a question, comment here. Do the Treg enhancing benefits of high-dose vitamin, vitamin D outweigh the risk for, that they can upregulate ACE2 for COVID-19? This is exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, ACE2 upregulation may have different expressions based on other type of messenger systems that are upregulated or downregulated at the same time. Um, the immune system does not work in a linear fashion. It works in a multilinear, three-dimensional system. Um, you know, when you're looking at isolating a drug to block one pathway, every time they do it with drugs, it's a disaster. Uh, it causes significant side effects, especially down the road. Um, so it's always a bad idea to look at the immune system as one single pathway. That's that's kind of the, the key thing here. Okay. Um, what else here? Um, SIBO, high in fiber. Obviously, if you have SIBO and, and personal uniquenesses, then you have to kind of work with your fiber intake. If you do have uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and you can't take a lot of fiber, I'm answering, answering Melanie's question here, um, then you can just probably just take butyrate as a supplement. And then if you if you take butyrate as a supplement, you can still get the immune effects, but without having the, the fiber that can trigger your small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Okay. Uh, Teresa asked, there's some rumors that individuals with whole blood types are more immune to the virus. What are your thoughts? Uh, time will tell. Different blood types are going to have different uh, antibody reactions. Different antibody reactions are going to have uh, different immune responses. So we have to kind of look at that. I think one of the questions people are confused about is why are some people vulnerable and why are some people not vulnerable? Because we know, for example, if you're elderly and your immune system is weak and you have some kind of pulmonary disease, you're for sure vulnerable. But why is the you know, healthy young athlete all of a sudden getting an infection? Um, that's one question. So there could be lots of reasons for this. So one of them could just be that their white blood cell counts are low. You know, uh, as a healthcare practitioner, I've been checking blood, blood panels on almost every new patient for over 20 years. I can tell you, you see a lot of healthy, healthy looking people, athletes that have really low white blood cells. Some of it is from overtraining. Some of it is for they have an autoimmune disease. They don't even know it. Um, some people have chronic infections like hepatitis C. They have no symptoms of it, but the white blood cell counts really low. So one of the reasons why um, some people may be more prone to getting uh, serious complications could be low white blood cell count. Um, so that's one. The other one is just uh, blood type. Your blood type can be a factor in your genes, but also we have different types of genotypes. And when they talk about different genotypes, um, there are different... Uh, what they call HLA-DQ genotypes, but, but determine how your T cells respond. There are different polymorphisms or gene uniquenesses and how your immune system has different messenger pathways. And some of the most uh, studied aspects of genotypes is related to hepatitis C research. So with hepatitis C, let me give you some, some concepts here so you, can, so you can understand how it may relate to coronavirus as we learn about it later. Um, there's different types of hepatitis C virus gene types too. Now, I think so far with coronavirus, we found a couple strains. We found there's a European strain and a Chinese strain. They don't find them to be vastly different from each other. But um, with, with hepatitis C, there's, there's different strains of hepatitis C virus that have mutated over time. And the type of hepatitis C viral genotype, the, the genes of the virus, combining with the host, the person that gets infected, can determine the out outcome. So certain hepatitis C virus gene types, when they... Uh, infect a host with their gene uniqueness could cause them to have liver failure very quickly. And for some other people um, with different viral genotypes and uh, different genes of a host, they may have the hepatitis C antibody but have no significant liver inflammation or fibrosis because of that, that combination. So that's one thing that's very interesting about um, why some people react to uh, coronavirus versus others. It may not always just be about the white blood cell count, but it can maybe do about some gene uniquenesses. That will take a long time for people to, to figure out and understand, but that's common with all viruses. And there's some people that have what are called SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms, 
which their genes are unique in certain ways that makes them not be able to get the infection. So there are people that have gene uniquenesses and they can never get HIV. <laughs> and other viruses are on the same thing. And, and this is uh, really amazing from a human um, species uh, immune concept that certain gene types are not going to get certain infections based on multiple, multiple factors of how their genes uh, are, are expressed. So I think when we're looking at uh, people's reactions to coronavirus, some that are completely asymptomatic, some that, that completely fall apart, there's probably a gene uniqueness component to it, and there's probably just a total white blood cell count component to it, and how their immune system has some pre, pre, um, risk factors uh, that may all be a trigger. So we don't know what all those are. Uh, you know, the best we can do is really just, we, we have our genes, we can't do anything about them. <laughs> uh, we can just try to improve our immune resilience with uh, our, our lifestyle and our interactions and so forth. Okay. Um, thank you for all the positive feedback. I'm, I'm getting a chance to look at uh, some of these um, feedbacks and I haven't done, I think this is my third live Facebook, but uh, I'm still new to it. But it's, it's, it's a pleasure to have everyone being so positive and uh, thank you all for being on being on today. I'll try to do more of these uh, in the future because uh, it seems like people are interested in them. So thank you for your interest. Okay, let me move on to some questions here. Um, so people have brought up fasting a couple times. I can see these questions. And this, this is a question that actually comes up all the time. So fasting does have an impact on the immune system and in a positive way. So when people go into a fasting state, there is a change in oxidative stress levels. There's a, your free radical production goes down, your antioxidant reserves go up in a fasting state that has the protective response supports your immune system. However, there are some people that cannot fast and, and that would be back to the hypoglycemics. So if you're hypoglycemic, if you get shaky, lightheaded, irritable throughout the day, and when you eat, you feel like you can function again, you're definitely not a person to fast. Fasting can really be, put you uh, in, in, the, in, in an uh, immune suppression state. So if you are an unstable, you have unstable energy throughout the day, and you're playing this bullet sugar roller coaster ride, and you're craving sugar all day and crashing, craving sugar all day and crashing, um, you should definitely not be fasting. Uh, that will cause you to release high amounts of stress hormones and cortisol, and you will fall apart. If you're a person who uh, can fast and not have any significant symptoms, then there, there are some benefits of fasting that can be very helpful for you. Another key concept that I just want to talk about, we talk about this in, my, in the uh, free immune resilience course, uh, is hydration. And one of the key things to understand about uh, how the immune system works and how water is so critical is that studies show that when people become dehydrated, their immune system dysfunctions. It's just that simple. You know, water carries oxygen, hydrogen, and water is responsible for many uh, biochemical and immunological reactions that are necessary for you to have a healthy immune response. But also, water has an impact on your osmolarity and the concentration of electrolytes and sodium in your in your in your system. And when you get dehydrated and you don't have enough fluid to change the viscosity and the osmotic pr pressure in your blood vessels, your immune system can't communicate very well. So another key thing to, to make sure that uh, you, you really do to try to keep your immune system as healthy as possible is to stay hydrated. As, stay hydrated. The key thing about that is you should never feel thirsty throughout the day. You should just get in a routine of drinking lots of water. That will make a huge impact on, on your immune system as well. Okay. Here's a question. What's the best way for diabetes type one to boost immune system? Uh, I can't tell you. That's too complicated. There's, you know, that's the key thing with the people who practice personalized medicine. Um, each person is unique in their own way. You have to look at their labs, look at their history. There's no general rules. This is what's, I think, frustrating for a lot of people too. Okay. Um, how about the carnivore diet for autoimmunity? I don't know. <laughs> carnivore diet... Uh, you know, your microbiome will completely change on a carnivore diet. Uh, I don't know. I think if you're worried about your immune fitness and you're trying to improve immune health, uh, now is not a time to try a drastic diet that completely changes your microbiome in, in, but reducing diversity. One of the key things about a carnivore diet, without question, is that 
even though you can decrease your antigen loads by just eating meats, because meats are typically not foods that cause severe inflammatory reactions for people. Um, so many people feel benefits when they're going to carnivore diet and their antigen load calms down and they're reducing their carbohydrate intake so their insulin levels start to calm down. Um, your microbiome diversity will completely shrink on a carnivore diet. Um, and that's one of the side effects people have is when they have significant uh, bowel symptoms after they go on a carnivore diet. So it, it may or may not be helpful for immune function right now, but uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's my gut feeling is I'm not sure if it's the best best response. Okay, let's go into some other questions here. So we talked about genetics, we talked about exercise, we talked about microbiome diversity. Um, we talked about vitamin C and A and all those. Uh, and I think at the at the end of the day, when I kind of look at these questions here, um, one of the key things to really think about is we just don't know a lot of things. Um, we don't know much about coronavirus. Um, there's going to have to be some retrospective studies that come out that, that teach us more, specifically with the medication or nutraceuticals that have an impact that's positive or negative. Um, we can't just apply general principles of what our immune system needs to function properly. So again, sleep, hydration, getting opioid reliance, opioid release, um, getting some physical activity to pump your lymphatics. Those are core principles. That will that will trans that will go across all types of viral infections of any kind, just just immune health, that are pretty reliable. So we can definitely count on those. Um, the other questions that seem to come up are, are really um, much more specific to to patients and and, and various things like that. Um, one person asks, uh, or I'll ask, uh, how do you hypoglycemic people should not should not fast? That was the key thing. I talk about that in my in my books too. If you get a chance to read my my um, book, Why Isn't My Brain Working? or Why Do I Still Have Thyroid Symptoms? We, we go into those as well. So um, the other key thing that you really want to, to think about um, during this, this coronavirus situation is to um, really just to get your information from accurate sources. I would strongly discourage everyone from getting any accurate information from any news channels doesn't really matter what your news stations are. Just go to the CDC, go to the World Health Organization, uh, educational resources. That's really where the real information is at. Um, what you're getting on news channels is an interpretation of it. And there is an intention to cause fear uh, when you look at news to really get people to stay tuned in, um, which is just horrific. So, uh, you know, really stay with CDC, World Health Organization. They have some of the best scientists in the world that are really sharing accurate information. Um, that's really the best place to, to, to keep information on. Um, stay away from commentary news, stay away from general news that, that is there to try to just freak you out with death toll numbers and, and all those things. That's not good for the humane system as well. Okay. Um, and then the other key thing I want to talk about is so someone, uh, Michelle, uh, how about gluten that's supposed to use the binder and thyroid meds? Well, in general, these are the key thing too. Besides, um, if you have autoimmunity, for example, um, what, or if you have sensitivities to food proteins or have immune reactions, if you um, constantly get exposed to your triggers, maybe your trigger is gluten, maybe your trigger is dairy, you're going to weaken your immune system. So if your immune system is dealing with food sensitivities all the time, you're going to make your immune system less efficient to deal with infections. So that's another problem we're seeing. Some people go, well, I kind of react to dairy or kind of react to milk or gluten, but you know, I'm stuck all day at home with the socks and I'm gonna just eat whatever. That's a terrible idea that will really have a negative impact on, on your immune function. So please be very conscious of your reactions to food proteins, uh, milk, uh, casein, protein in milk casein is the mo one of the most reactive the gluten in grains is very, very reactive. Egg albumin is very reactive and corn uh, proteins are very reactive for many, many people. Uh, some of you already know what those sensitivities are. If you know what those sensitivities are, now is really a time to focus on really being, uh, restricting those to really giving you, giving a chance for your immune system to have the, the best outcome. Um, anyways, uh, I think we're doing well here with uh, time here. Um, and uh, I encourage you guys to let me just kind of recap the key concepts here. Get an opioid response, 
by watching shows that make you happy, watch some YouTube clips, try to laugh, try to be with family, try to appreciate the time, try to reduce your time stressing out on negative things and death tolls and all that. That's not good for your immune system. Eat a high fiber diet with lots of diversity to improve your microbiome diversity that has a profound impact on immune regulation. Drink lots of water. Uh, staying hydrated makes your immune system really, really efficient. Um, if you want to fast, that's fine. Make sure you're not hypoglycemic if, if you are trying to do a fasting state. Um, supplements, um, there's, there's, you know, the key things is A, C, and D, which are the most common nutrients that help. Uh, but to all, there's lots of botanical support to immune system way beyond what we can talk about in the short period. Antioxidants seem to be helpful. Eating lots of superfoods, flavonoids can be a great way to support yourself. And anyways, we'll try to come back here again and, and try to try, I'll try to look at these questions uh, later and maybe we'll do another video um, when I can kind of get an idea. It's hard to get all your thoughts across and try to read questions at the same time, but uh, we'll definitely put another video together very shortly. Let me just kind of get a chance to read all the questions and we'll comment more. And uh, I summarize a lot of these key concepts. Um, if you go to Dr. K News, I write articles and information for people that are following my work uh, as an author. Uh, but I put together a few free immune resilience program that goes over all the lifestyle things we talked about. It has some videos and some notes. Uh, hopefully that can help you all and uh, hope everyone's safe. And thank you for joining.